share what I'm going to share with you today. Um, mostly because it's a message for me. Um, so I, I told the first service, at least one person will be blessed and it will be me. But I hope that you guys get blessed. But again, I've, I've never been this enthusiastic and excited to share this message of hope that I have um, received from the Lord. So um, you guys ready to get into it? Cool, cool. So um, many of us in America, some of us are natural born, some of us are immigrants. Um, I'm a first generation immigrant. My father and my grandparents, they came from here. My father's the first born son, but they came here in like the 60s from Portugal. So people come to America and born in America with this thing called the American dream. It's a reason to come here. It's a reason people stay here. It's, it's, it's something that we're being fed. Um, it's in our culture as a nation. And that is, if you work hard, if you work smart, if you keep pressing forward, it doesn't matter how many times you fail, you can succeed. That's the success story of, a, of the American dream. Don't quit, and you can find success in whatever it is. You have people, you know, like uh, P.T. Barnum, Donald Trump, George Foreman, Henry Ford, Stan Lee, the Marvel guy, Walt Disney. All these guys have one very specific theme in common, and that is they've all filed bankruptcy, some maybe more than others, but they achieved their success by not quitting. But... <clears throat> We have this situation in the American church where we're called in and we're told that we're amazing. We're made in the image of God. But when we start trying to act like we're supposed to be an imitator of God to do awesome things, we have people telling us, slow down. You're amazing. Just don't be amazing. You're, you're just too prideful. You're just too arrogant. You're trying to take God's glory. Just slow down. You're actually just supposed to struggle a little bit more. You're supposed to be stuck in your kind of sin nature. We're kind of capped, and the promise and the goal of Christ's likeness is taken from us. We're American, and we can do whatever we want in business, but in the American church, it's like don't achieve your dreams of being Christ-like. That's the goal, right? To look like him, act like him. But we're, we're called to almost struggle. So me and Daniel today, we want to take the cap off right? Because a righteous man may fall how many times yet get up again? Seven times. Seven times. That's not biblically accurate. You're not called to struggle. You're called to hope. You're called to achieve Christ's likeness. Amen? So I'm going to take you down a trail and hopefully paint a picture for you to inspire hope in you knowing that it's possible. Amen? I'll take you through Ephesians. That's my first scripture passage today is going to be Ephesians. Pastor has asked me to slow down. Apparently, I went really fast in the first service because we got like 15 minutes less, so I saved my Red Bull for after, so I don't have wings right now, okay? Maybe later I will, but let's get into it. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with what? Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, and where is it found? In Christ, just as he chose us, he's chosen us, he's called us, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be what? Holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestined us, predestined means he chose us for a purpose to what? Adoption as a sons and, sons and daughters, right? By Christ Jesus himself. So we have been given every spiritual blessing, we're called to be holy and blameless, and we're called to be royalty because we've been adopted by a king. Uh, <clears throat> Where am I at? According to his good pleasure of his will, to the praise and glory of his grace, by which he made us accepted in the beloved. Verse 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace, by which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself. Next verse. That in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one, all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth. In him also we have obtained an inheritance. We've been given something. Being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. So he's called us to a purpose that we've been chosen to do. And he works all things according to his will to make that purpose happen. You guys following me? We're called to be holy. We're called to be blameless. He's given us every spiritual, bla every spiritual blessing. We're in his family, we are sons and daughters of a king, and he's saying that he will work all things accordingly, according to the counsel of his will, of what he wants to be done. Got it? Okay, so Paul, Paul is starting the book of Ephesians with these ideas of things that God has called us to be, right? Because last week, RJ had talked about calling and purpose. 
calling and purpose in life. Well, today me and Daniel want to talk about calling and purpose in character, calling and purpose in nature, how we're supposed to act and walk and how we can get past some of the things that may be withholding us. So Paul begins to pray. Verse 15, he begins to actually pray. We get an insight of Paul's prayer life right here. So he says, therefore, I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus, do not, uh, and your love for the saints, do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. You guys see that little semicolon right there? Typically, in grammar, a semicolon is used to list things after. So, like, for example, if I'm making, like, a pico de gallo, I want to go and buy tomatoes, onions, lime, cilantro, serrano, or jalapeno, but your list is over when you were, use the word and, like A, B, and C, my list is over, and each one is separated by commas. I'm just trying to share this with you because for the longest time, I thought this was like the worst run-on sentence I've ever heard. But once I broke it down as a list, it began to make sense to me. So there's four things here that Paul is praying for us as believers to get a grasp of. Number one, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of him. Who is him? Jesus. It's the Father, right? Number two, the eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling. He's not just praying, and this is what I'm going to hit on in a minute. He's not just praying that you would know your calling. In your calling, this is what gets me excited, and I can't wait to share. There is hope of that calling. Third thing. Sorry, I get lost. Where am I at? Third thing. Uh, what, that you would know what are the riches of his inheritance? Where is that inheritance found? In the saints. It's very important when you read scripture that you look at these little words, like in, by, to. They give you clues. Is his inheritance for the saints? It's not what he's saying. His inheritance is in the saints. Different. And I'll explain that in a second. Fourth thing he prays is... And what is the, we would know what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand of heavenly places, far above every single power in the entire universe. Follow me? These are the four things. Okay, so I'm going to get into the second thing first of what Paul is praying for us to know. And it's so that you may know what is the hope of his calling. You see, it's one thing to be called to do something. It's another thing to be able to do it. Right? If I go and tell my son, Jaden, hey, I want you to go mow the lawn. Well, he's six. He can't even get it started. It's not possible. You see, this is not how God calls you. You see, there is hope. This word hope, and this is what fires me up because I get emotional. <clears throat> I don't know if you've ever felt like you're not enough. Like what you are supposed to do, you can't do. They, 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 you're a failure, you're a loser, that you just look at yourself when you think bad things because you want to be great, but you can't. But let me tell you about this hope that Paul is praying that we would get to know. You see, the word hope is the word elpis, elpis in Greek. And it's not hope as in if I buy a lottery ticket, I just hope that one day I'm going to be a millionaire. Like, I just really hope I'm going to make it. I just really hope I get to this calling. No, let me tell you what this hope is. It's hope that I'm in the middle of a storm and Jesus is in the boat and I'm going to make it to the other side because he said it. It's hope that when he says to walk on water, that when I take my first step, I'm going to find solid ground. It's hope knowing I've been called by God and this giant in the valley named Goliath doesn't stand a chance. It's hope knowing that I'm bound by lust. I'm bound by anger. I'm bound by addiction. I'm bound by depression. I'm bound by anxiety. But he called me to be Christ-like. And there's hope. There's expectation. There's belief. There's faith knowing that I'm going to get through it because who he has called me to be doesn't look like that. I've never met a Christ-like person bound by anything. When I look at Jesus, he wasn't bound by anything. And God has called us to look like that. So whatever you're going through right now, get to know the hope. The hope that will pull you through. Get excited because he's called you to be Christ-like and he's providing everything according to the counsel of his will. That's what Ephesians says. These aren't my words. If he's called you to business, then he's providing everything that you need to learn the business. If he's called you to be a pastor like he called RJ, he's providing everything that RJ needs to become a pastor. But here's the problem. We don't know his training manual. Just as Joseph, RJ talked about last week, was called to be a ruler of Egypt, his ruler training was awfully weird. He was thrown in a pit. He was thrown in a jail. He was thrown in a house. Then Pharaoh called him out. His training was different. 
So here's what I'm getting at. How can you achieve your call if you quit? How can you achieve whatever it is that you're looking for if you quit? And how can you persevere if you don't have a hope of your success? Because if he's called you, you are more than a conqueror in Christ. If he has called you, he has given you everything that you need in him to achieve whatever it is that is desired for you to achieve. Amen? God would not call you to do something impossible, only impossible without him. I hope you're getting hope today, church, knowing that whatever it is, however you feel, doesn't reflect the end result. You feel bound. Have hope, expectation, belief that Jesus has called you to the other side. If you're in the middle of a storm in a boat, rather than be afraid, afraid, cast your line in the water because I hear the fish bite when it's raining. Have hope knowing that you're going to get to the other side. And I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm really going to focus on this this morning. So next verse, Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing. These aren't my words, church. These are hits. There is no cap on you today. There's no cap on you tomorrow. There's no cap on you ever. That he who has begun good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. He will complete it. Have hope. The third thing that Paul prays. What are the riches of his inheritance in the saints? Where's the inheritance? It's in us. You see, Jesus gathered us, he died, and rose again. When there is death, there is a passing of an inheritance. We have been given to the Father as an inheritance. And the Father looks at this inheritance, he's the appraiser, and he goes, wow, I am incredibly rich. Me, you, every single one of you, that he was given to the Father, he has appraised your value and counted himself as incredibly wealthy. And let me tell you why. There's this picture that uh, I learned about in like middle school or something. It's called uh, the Starry Night. You can get that photo up. Um, forgive me, I actually gave it like half the photo. I apologize. Um, I cut off the bottom. But this picture right here I learned about in school, and, and I, I'm not, I don't mean to be disrespectful, and, and I hope that I'm not. But when I look at this, to me, it looks like something that my daughter Addison can draw. She's, she's artistic, and I feel like she could draw. That looks like a very, you know, young kind of drawing, if, if I may. And I don't really see much value in it. It's until I learn about the photo. Anybody know who created that photo? Vincent Van Gogh. You see, once you learn that Vincent Van Gogh created the photo, I no longer look at it as an eight-year-old photo. I look at it as a masterpiece. Anybody have an idea of how much this, this, this uh, picture is appraised at? Over $100 million. This picture right here that looks like it could be made by my daughter is worth $100 million. Is it because it's the most beautiful thing you've ever seen? No, it's because it was created by Vincent van Gogh. How much more of value are we knowing that we've been crafted, we have been created, we have been molded by Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Christ. That when he looks at you, he doesn't see your flaws, he sees the value of your creator. It doesn't matter what it looks like. If you know the creator, you see the value. Follow me, church? Come on, and I'm going to keep hitting this because he is providing everything that you need to be the finished product of Christ's likeness. Next thing he prays, the greatness of us, of the greatness of his power towards us who believe. And I'm going to reread this scripture. Can I get verse 19? So that we may know what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he, uh, which he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right uh, see that the, he the hand in the heavenly place is far above every principality, power, and ruler in high places, okay? Follow me. Paul wants you to know Jesus. The first thing he prays, revelation of him. Second thing, he wants you to know you need to have hope because what you're going towards is not an, a line A to B. It's not a, it's not a B line. It's going to be wiggly. It's going to be wrathy. Have hope knowing that God has called you to be someone, to act like him, to talk like him, to have victory in your life in a particular area, and it's not going to be easy, but you're valuable because God has created you, so he looks at you as rich. I mean, as an inheritance, he looks at himself rich, and then he's saying, just to put the cherry on top, the same power 
that when Jesus went into hell, that pulled him out of hell, out of the grave, gave him his resurrected body, put him into heavenly places next to Christ, far above any power in the entire universe, is working in you. That same power is working in you right now in every single task of your life. Whatever it is that you're pushing toward, that power that put Christ in heavenly places is operating in you. He has given every resource to you for you to achieve your call in your life and in your character in Christ's likeness. Amen. I don't know about you guys. But I feel like there's things in life that I can't do. There's battles in my life that I feel like I can't win. But when I tap into the power of he who is in me, when he who is greater than the world, I start getting a little bold. I start taking the faith off of the mirror, and I start putting it in the scripture, and I start putting my faith in who he is and what he's capable of than what I'm capable of. David defeated Goliath first in his mind, first through faith. And then he picked up a stone and slayed it in reality. We got to have a hope that if he called us to something, it doesn't matter what's in front of us, we can get through it because he is not a man that should lie. Amen? Amen. And, just because, and just in case you don't believe me, we're going to go on to the next scripture. Just in case, I'm telling you, I want you to walk out of this place like you believe it. Like whatever's in front of you is not going to stop you because you have a hope in the calling of your life. 2 Peter 1, <clears throat> grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God. Where are these things coming from? What's the first thing Paul prayed? Paul prayed that you may know the revelation of him. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord according as his divine power hath, this is King James, has given unto us what? What has he given us? All things again. Paul said it in Ephesians. Peter's saying in, in, in Peter, all things pertaining unto life and godliness. Through what? Through the knowledge of him. And is that where he stops? No. Through the knowledge of him who called us to. He called us to something. What did he call us to? He's calling us to glory and virtue. You see, it blows my mind when I begin looking at Jesus and his unselfishness and his humility, and his meekness, and his character, that he would pick up somebody like me, cover me in the blood of Jesus, look at me in all my faults, look at me in all my ways, and say, you know what? My ways are better than your ways, so I'm going to make you look just like me. I'm going to share my character with you. I'm going to share my image with you. He is not a God that is selfish. He wants you to look like him, act like him, talk like him, think like him. He's giving you the mind of Christ. And it takes a boldness to look at Christ and receive the gift. We have many people who won't receive a handout at all. They won't receive $5 if they need it. And we have this problem in the church where we're afraid to receive even from the Father. He has said, I've given you everything that you need to achieve this victory. But I need you to lower your pride, and I need you to come in Christ and receive what I have for you. Amen. Thank you, church. I hope you leave this place with hope today. Amen, amen. That's good, huh? Hope. He said we got 15 more minutes, but I did not get 15 minutes. I don't know how I'm supposed to follow that. I should have went first. And got some extra minutes with it. <laughs> Amen. Come on, we just want to build on top of that. We're talking about your purpose, your calling. What is your next step? What's the next thing for you to do? What is that? What does it look like? And what's staring you back in the face? One thing that I, I love about this is there's nothing new under the sun. The same tactics that were used in the Bible are the same tactics that are used against us today. We're trying to remove all of those obstacles that are in our way, that are, that are staring us uh, in the face. So today I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you, what fear are you facing? What fear is looking back at you and trying to paralyze you? What fear is staring you in the face, trying to stop you from making your next move? 
Because we need to confront it. We need to look at it, we need to look at it and say, no, you are not going to defeat me. We're going to use the Bible uh, to see uh, how they faced it uh, back in the Bible. Ecclesiastes 1.9 says, history merely repeats itself. It has all been done before. Nothing under the sun is truly new. Sometimes people say, here's something new, but actually it's old. Nothing is ever truly new. We don't remember what happened in the past. In the future generations, no no one will remember what we're doing now. So I want to look at a couple areas of scripture. Uh, Hebrews 12.1 says, Therefore, since we have surrounded by such a huge cloud of witnesses to the life of faith, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. Let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. We do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. Amen? So good. Let us strip off every weight that slows us down. There's some things that in our lives that we, we need to get rid of. There's some things that are staring us in the face that we need to confront that we need to know, uh, uh, why do I feel this way? It might be a simple step that we need to take. Our next step may be as simple as growth track. But there's something that stops you from going to growth track. And all you got to do is go sit in a room. And listen. But there's still, there's something that stops you from going. It might be joining a small group. That might be your next step, joining a small group. Go hang out with a bunch of people and learn about Jesus. Pretty hard. But there's something that stops us. It was small groups for me. I did not want, not not my thing, sorry. Oh, come and make friends. No, I got friends, I'm cool. Come and, you know, do this. And I'm like, you know what? It is, honestly, it's just very awkward and uncomfortable for me. It's not something that, you know, if you know me, you get it. But I, you know, it's one of those things that I had to, to confront some things in myself. That I had to take a stand in myself and be like, dude, what are you doing? I had no idea what was on the other end. I just knew I didn't want to do that. Right? There was this fear. Like, man, I'm going to have to go sit and talk with people. Not my thing. Not something I really wanted to do. But I had to face that fear. And then I had some, so I, you know, people like, do I want to join a small group? No. Thank you, though. I don't, but I don't want to join a small group. And then some friends asked me to help lead a small group. So now I'm going to lead a small group that I don't like. <laughs> but I, you know, I didn't want to, I, I wanted my friends to lead and it was their first time leading and I wanted to help them. And so it was like, you know, okay, I'll do it. You know what I mean? And so I take that step, and it changed my life forever. It changed my life forever. I didn't realize what was on the other side of that small group. I didn't realize that confronting my fears and putting down those, those, those doubts about myself and all those things, that it was going to set me free in such a way that it was going to call me into a purpose and call me into the ministry. I had no idea. I had no idea that God was making my crooked places straight by joining a small group. I didn't realize the victory that was on the other side of my small group. I came to church. I was faithful. I I served. I remember I used to sit over here, and Katerina was in charge of the ushers back then, and be like, hey, brother, you want to help pass the offering buckets? We passed the buckets back there. 
And I did my part. I'd come and worship, but I didn't know that on the other side of my fear was my victory uh, in, in my purpose, in my calling, and what God had for me. So today, I want to challenge you. What's staring you in the face? What is paralyzing you that you, that you, can't, you can't move forward? I had to look at myself. The devil tried to discourage you. That you can't do that. You're not called to that. Just in your ear, just won't stop. You have to, tr- you have to choose who you listen to. Are you repeating what the devil is saying or are you repeating what God is saying? When you get that self-doubt, you're just doubting what God has spoken over you. You're doubting that promise that God has put inside of you. You're doubting the word of God. You're just not doubting yourself. He's spoken over you. He's spoken promises over you. He's spoken victory over you. And doubting that is doubting him. What's your next step? What is hindering you? We're talking about taking the cap off. God is not capping you. There's so much that he has for you. But it's your fear, those things that we don't deal with. We have a saying around here, we deal with the funky. If there's some funkiness in your life, deal with it. Address it. Look it in the face. Look it in the eyes. Say, no, we're going to get rid of you. No, we're going to deal with you. I don't know what I have to do. I don't know if I have to go through uh, deliverance. I don't know if I just need to get into the word more. But we're going to deal with it, and we're going to settle it. Amen? There's nothing new under the sun. So we can look, I can look at the Bible, and I can find my way because the tactics are still the same. Amen? We're going to look at Judges 6. The Israelites have turned their back on God. God's turned them over to the Midianites who are mean and cruel. They're starving them. And Israel's like, oh, God, please help us. Come back. We're sorry. So God's like, okay, I'm going to come help you. We're going to pick up the story in verse 11, uh, Judges 6, 11. When the angel of the Lord came and sat beneath the great tree of Obra, which belonged to Joash, the clan of Ebrees, Gideon, son of Joash, was threshing wheat at the bottom of the wine press to find grain from the Midianites, to hide grain from the Midianites. They were hiding their food. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. The Lord is speaking that over you today. Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. A lot of times we we cry out to God to get to deal with our fear, to deal with what we're facing. And God's saying, wait, I've given you. You're calling me, I've given it to you. I've given you the victory. I've given you the way out. This is up for you to take that step. This is up for you to stare it in the face and stare it down and say, I'm not moving. I will not give up. I will not quit. Sir, Gideon replied, if the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Doesn't that sound familiar? Why is this happening? If you're with me, why is this happening? Why am I going through this? I've had cancer three times. Why is this happening? I'm a mighty hero. I'm a mighty hero. The Lord is with me. And where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt, but now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. Then the Lord turned, the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. 
I'm sending you. I'm sending you. Go with the strength you have. But Lord Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? How is someone like me going to be able to do something like this? We say the same things. How am I going to do this? We get that orphan spirit where all of a sudden we can't function. We're in that passenger seat that God would do it for somebody else, but he won't do it for me. We develop that self-doubt, that doubt that turns quickly into doubting who God is and doubting the promises he's spoken in our life. We lose our identity because we begin to doubt who we are. When that starts to swirl, when that doubt starts to, to swirl, we have to find, we, we, we have to take a stand. You have to shut those voices down. My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Man Manish, and I am the least in my entire family. What are my family and friends going to say? What if I fail? What if I lose everything? Fear begins to move and we begin, and fear begins to take over and we're paralyzed. I felt this when I was getting ready that, that God was talking to our businessmen and women. That God is calling you uh, into deeper places, into deeper things, to trust him more to take that bigger step, to take that next step in your business, take that, to take that next step in what God has for you, to take that next step in your giving. It's all a trust issue. And you trust him. Don't let that doubt that you don't trust him. You trust him. That's how you've gotten where you are right now. All of us. You trust him. But don't ignore things. If there's fear staring in your face, you need to address it. Deal with things in your life. Don't just let them hang out. The Lord said to him, I will be with you, and you will destroy the Midianites as if you were fighting against one man. Gideon replied, if you're truly going to help me, show me a sign to prove that this is really the Lord speaking to me. Don't go away until I come back and bring my offering to you. He said, he answered, I will stay here until you return. I want to skip down to verse 25. Something else Gideon had to do. That night the Lord said to Gideon, take the bull from your father's herd, the one that is seven years old, pull down your father's altar to Baal, to cut and cut down the Asherah pool standing beside it. Then build an altar to the Lord your God here on this hilltop sanctuary, laying the stones carefully. Sacrifice the bull as its burnt offering on the altar, using as fuel uh, the wood of the Asherah pool you cut down. So Gideon took the ten servants and did as the Lord commanded. But he did it at night because he was afraid of the other members of his father's household and the people of the town. So the Lord's requiring them to pull down the idols. Pull down all of those things that are before him. I was reading the book of Ezekiel, and I was like, just, just reading through it, and I was like, man, the Lord is super mad. He was not happy. And I was just, I was just, I was kind of blown away by it. He says, I'm going to bring war upon you and destroy your pagan shrines. Everything that you are putting before me, I'm going to destroy. Everything that's number one, but not me. I'm like, dude, he is not playing. He is mad. And I'm like, wait, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not happy when we allow things to get in front of him. 
He's not happy when we allow things, even good things, even church, to get in front of him. He does not like that. And then in chapter 6, I ran into this verse. He says, uh, they recognize how hurt I am by their unfaithful hearts and lustful eyes longing for their idols. And sometimes we don't put in context what our idols do to him when we allow things to get in front of him and how it makes him feel. Because he says right there how hurt I am. It hurts him. It hurts him. It's just not, you know, to us it's like, oh, well, there, there I go again. Oh, you know, well, I'll try harder next time. No, there is, there is a consequence to him. There is a pain and a hurt when we allow a, a, a new love to come into our life. But we need to deal with the idols in our life. We need to make sure that our life gets in order, is in proper order, and it stays in order. Amen? Amen. Back to Gideon. Gideon, they have so many men, they cut them down, right? They ended up with 300 men to fight in this war, to fight, to, to, get, uh, to fight the Midianites. They ended up using jar clays. Because God's with them. Because God was with them. God is with you. Amen. I want to close with this. Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Put him first. You want all these things? Put him first. Get order back in your life. Get the tear down the idols that need to be torn down. I don't care what they are, sports, people, things, your job. Get your life in order. Tear down those idols and let God add to you. Amen? Amen, amen. Stand with me, church. Stand with me. See, there's a calling in your life. And in between the calling in your life and the end result is the fear that Daniel's talking about. And today, we spent some time trying to persuade you and encourage you, knowing that there is hope to get you through that middle process. That there is hope because you're a mighty warrior, and that's how he calls you. Because God is with you. That the hope and the power to get through the fear is found in Christ. Now that I've been in Christ now for, I don't know, over a decade, I don't know how I, how I got through the first portion of my life. I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't remember what it's like to not have that hope. So today, first thing is, maybe you don't know Jesus. Maybe, maybe there's something stirring in you. Maybe you don't know who he is. And I'm telling you, there is nothing like a life that is shared with Jesus. I've done both. Trust me when I tell you, Jesus is the way. There is nothing like being in Jesus. So today, if I can have the altar team up, number one, maybe you don't know Jesus. Today is a great day to meet him. Number two, you're going through things. Maybe it's a sin thing. Not everything we go through, not everything I'm talking about is sin, but we do deal with the sin things. Some things are life things. Daniel is calling and, and, and had a word for entrepreneurs. Maybe there's a business thing. Joseph wasn't in sin when he was sent to jail. And he wasn't in sin when he was promoted to the palace. Sometimes there are things in our life, whether they're sin or reality, we need the hope to push us through them. So today, if you're struggling with hope, if you need an encouragement, if you need a filling, if you need an opportunity to meet with God, 
We're calling you to these altars. Don't let fear hold you back. Your next step could simply be a faith walk down to a person to receive prayer. Find out what that is. Get back in Christ. Stay in Christ. And let hope and excitement and faith in who he is and who he says you've called to be carry you through. God bless you, church.